want me to say it? <laughs> yeah, welcome to a special edition of Race Talk Revolution, where your voice matters. I'm your host and founder of Race Talk Revolution, Incorporated Reverend Lane Cobb. Um, my regular co-host uh, for these things, uh, Mr. A.J. Woodson of Black Westchester Magazine. I was called to another event, so I'm going to be here solo. But I am here with Tamara Bridgewater and Jermaine Smith. Um, and today, as I said, we are partnering with um, Arts 105.66. And uh, this program is made possible by the Rockefeller's Brothers Fund Partnership. Um, our title for this evening's conversation is Off-Broadway, Performance, Place, and Ethnicity in Theater, TV, and Film. Our panelists this evening are award-winning actors that you will no doubt uh, recognize and whom we are looking forward to hearing from for sure. Before we introduce our panel, I'd like to invite um, Tamara Bridgewater and Jermaine Smith to talk about their organizations and to say a little bit about why this discussion about race and the arts is important. Hi, um, good evening, everyone. I'm Tamara Bridgewater. And uh, for this evening, I'm here in representation of Arts 10566, where I am program uh, coordinator. It's an after school enrichment program and a community program that is um, based out of Peekskill. And they uh, are the ones that are in partnership with the Rockefeller Brother Fund. And so we want to welcome our panelists and uh, thank you for giving your time um, and your energy to this conversation. And Jermaine can talk about um, our partnership. Yeah, I want to thank everyone for being here. And again, thank Lane Cobb for having us in for this wonderful podcast that she's been doing for a number of years now. Um, pleasure to have you as well as our panelists tonight. I'm really looking forward to the conversation. Um, NU Builds is an organization we started um, five years ago. It stands for Empower Network and her whole purpose is um, youth engagement, youth development. Um, we do a lot of community engagement work and uh, all, of our, all of our efforts lead towards some type of youth development and trying to really build uh, the youth in the community. Um, so this partnership with Brothers from the Pecanico is, is what is allowing us to do this tonight, and we're really looking forward to getting this conversation going. So I'll leave it at that, and hopefully, we'll have a good audience and a, a fruitful conversation. Thank you all. Thank you, Jermaine. Thank you. So I'm going to go ahead and read um, uh, the bios for Keith Hamilton Cobb and Terrence Bernie Hines. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for being here. We really do appreciate the work that you're doing. We know that you're busy. Thank you really, really, really from the bottom of my heart, our hearts for being here today. Keith Hamilton Cobb is not only my brilliant brother, but he is also an actor and a playwright who has been drawn mostly to the stage in his working life, but is also recognized for several unique character portrayals he has created for television. He has appeared in classical and contemporary roles on regional stages countrywide. He is a graduate of New York University's Tisch School of the Arts, with a BFA in acting. His award-winning play, American Moor, published by Methuen Drama, which explores the perspective of the African-American male through the metaphor of Shakespeare's Othello, ran off-Broadway at Cherry Lane Theater in the fall of 2019. It is a winner of an Elliot Norton Award, an Odell Co Award, two Ernie Awards, and is part of the permanent collection of the Folger Shakespeare Library. Keith is the director of the Untitled Othello Project, currently in residence at Sacred Heart University and in collaboration with Blessed Unrest Theater, which operates as an extended touring interrogation and rehearsal with actors and educators of Shakespeare's play, exploring the human struggles with race, religion, and sexuality that it activates wherever it is performed. You can find out more about that production and Keith Hamilton Cobb at AmericanMoor.com untitledothello.com and keithhamiltoncobb.com. Award-winning actor Terrence Bernie Hines has been cast and directed in films by Academy Award-winning directors James Mangold and Peter Farrelly. He has shared the stage and or screen with some of the great actors in history from Meryl Streep in Stuck on You to Alfred Molina in Identity, Harrison Ford in Crossing Over, Bo Bridges in Rush Life, and Ben Stiller, Shirley MacLaine, and Kristen Wiig, The Secret Life of Walter Mitty, and Matt Damon, Stuck on You, and the late Ed Asner, to name a few. 
He won the 2022 Rising Black Voices Award as co-director of the documentary film Hiplet at the Portland International Film Festival, along with his wife, Sonia Machado Hines. Terrence was born and raised in Detroit's notoriously tough West Side. At the age of 14, he was attacked by a neighborhood gang and wound up flatlining on the hospital table before suddenly recovering. Humor had a hand in his firmer, further recovery and has since remained an integral part of his life. As an adult, Terrence relocated to LA where he was cast in a short film called Red Zone by a friend in acting class. Six months later, he wrote his, he won his first movie role. Since then, he has appeared in dozens of films and television projects alongside Oscar winners and nominees, as well as nearly 100 national and international commercials. You can find out more about Terrence Bernie Hines at IMDB backslash Terrence Bernie Hines. And we will have our guests put their um, contact info into the chat a little bit later. Right now, I would like to welcome both of our speakers to the platform. Again, thank you so much. We appreciate your time and your talent. And when um, Mr. Boatman arrives, I will read his bio uh, at that time. So each of you have been in the business for over two decades. Um, we are very interested to find out first, if you would, what brought you to the craft of acting? Uh, that would be our first question. The second tier to that question is, as Black males, how has race and ethnicity informed the work that you do? And third, what were some influences that supported your direction? I'll, I'll speak first if you, uh, if you want me to. And answer By all means. Questions. First of all, uh, thank you for having me today. It's my honor to speak on these subjects. Um, I, I've always been a fan of, uh, you know, I, would, I was a kid, I was basically raised by TV. Uh, my mother died at a, at a, when I was a young kid. And my father, uh, because he wanted to take good care of me, he, he worked two jobs to, um, to get me in the best schools that I could get into. And so I was raised by, you know, all the TV shows, you know, all of the, you know, uh, the great acting, the great comedy, the great everything. And so I've, I've kind of had this knack of wanting to have this effect on other people in a good way. Um, you you kind of mentioned that little incident that happened when I was uh, 15, when I got attacked by a gang. I grew up in a really, really bad neighborhood. People who, who know me now, they're pretty shocked that, that I actually survived that area um, for as long as I did. I did because, you know, um, I knew that I had a lot to give. I knew that there was a, a, some pretty good things that I was going to do in my life. I had no idea, no clue what it would be, but I knew there was a reason why I was here and I was not gonna leave until <laughs> I had done what I had done. I mean, by the time I was 15, there had been literally three assassination attempts on my life. Um, one time I was uh, in the Boy Scouts and I don't know if I'm getting too off the subject here, but this kid tried to throw me off a cliff. And um, I was like, wait a minute, what's going on? What are you doing? He was a white kid and um, he just had two words for me. Actually, four words, die you fucking nigger. So I realized at that point that, um, -uh. I, I'm not. If, if I'm going, he's coming with me. So we kind of wrestled with each other a little bit and uh, finally he got up and just ran away. Um, and I knew at that point, no, I'm not ready to go. Um, so um, I continued to, I went to the University of Detroit. I, I did training in theater. I really loved it. Um, and eventually I found my way over to Hollywood. Um, and I gotta tell you, I, I consider myself one of the most fortunate people in the world in regards to my career, because every step of the way from the beginning to, you know, to now, people have always like lent me a hand um, and offered me a way in or, you know, done something that was really accepting of me into the industry. Um, so I, I, like I said, I came here in my first scene in my acting class, um, I got a standing ovation. And I was like, wow, that's pretty cool. It's nice to hear. So the, the class was over and this guy walks up to me and he goes, you're cast. And I'm like, 
okay, cast in what? And so he was like, well, you know, I, I'm writing this short film and you're the guy. I, you are going to be my star of this movie. And so I was like, great, let's do it. So we did it and um, never thought about it after that. It was great fun. I had fun. He had fun. Literally six months later, I came home to a recording on my answering machine because they were a thing back then. And there was this message and it goes, hey, is this Terrence Bernie Hines? I'd like to I like to get in touch with you. I have this movie that I just finished writing with my brother. Uh, this is Peter Fairley. Um, would you give me a call back? And I'm like, hmm, okay. So I called him back. Turns out he found my number. He just, he did, he actually got somebody to find out where I was, who I was. And he called me up and um, he goes, look, Terrence, uh, we just finished this script. We got Meryl Streep. We got Matt Damon. We got Greg Kinnear. We got Cher. We, we're working on getting Warren Beatty. But there's this one particular role that uh, you are just absolutely perfect for. I saw this movie. You did this short film. And I don't even know where it came from. But would you be willing to read my script? And I was like, uh, hell yeah. So uh, I read it, went to his um, office with his brother and their producers. and. They wanted to give me the part, but they played a joke on me um, and said they were not going to give me the part until I did certain things uh, that was just part of their kind of, you know, sense of humor. I did them and I got the part. And next thing I knew, I was on uh, in Miami Beach for the next six weeks working with all these A-list actors. And they took me under their wing. Meryl Streep was like, I learned more from her in between scenes that I had in any acting class up to that point, and some even since that point. Um, Matt Damon, one of the nicest guys I ever met in my life, you know, I I thought I was gonna get fired from the film after the first scene because the director did like 30 takes. This was my first big film, 30 takes. I walk away and it was a scene with him and Matt Damon and Eva Mendez, who was also in the movie, knowing I'm gonna get fired and you know, I get about 10 feet and he comes up behind me and he goes, Terrence, don't worry about it. You did great. He does the same thing with me. Um, and he kind of took me under his wing to help make sure that I was like, you know, he gave me the idea that I belonged. Um, and the other guys did too. So I've had this thing where I've been very fortunate to be, you know, given the idea that I do belong. I am in the right place by so many people that did not have to do that. Um, so I've kind of like, you know, struggled along the way, did a whole bunch of commercials, did, you know, I finished my 20th feature uh, a few months ago, earlier this year, it's going to be coming out in January, it's a, a feature with uh, Danny Houston and um, Bob Odenkirk, um, coming out January 27th, and, you know, that was just another thing, you, you're allowed, around this business long enough, and if you're not just a complete a-hole, people kind of might like you if you got a little bit of talent and, you know, you might end up working more as long as you continue to do that, that successful action of, of being who you are, being true to yourself and um, making a difference. I have learned so much along the way. I've dealt with prejudice along the way. Even people that were prejudiced were, they were prejudiced in kind of what they felt was a nice way, right? Um, I don't want to say that he's a bad person because he's really, really, really not. Um, there's a there's a gentleman, uh, Ben Stiller. We've all heard of Ben Stiller. Ben Stiller is a great guy. He's a nice guy. But, you know, he, how do I put this? Um, there was one, he directed me in, in this movie called The Secret Life of Walter Mitty. And um, he loves me. Uh, he used to talk to me about how much his father really used to hang around in jazz clubs. And that's where he learned to really like black people because they were so talented. Um, but one point in one direction, he says to me, Terrence, no, uh, -uh. that's not the way black people act. Black people, they, they do things this way. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. really? You are a 53-year-old Jewish white guy telling me that I'm not Black enough. And he told me, you know, how he felt that I should do that particular part. 
And then, of course, I did it the way that I felt like I should do it, being authentic to myself. And he ended up being happy with that. Now, I say this, I, I, I don't think there's a prejudice bone in his body, but someone could take offense to that, being told how to be black, quote unquote, um, on film. I think that he said that because as he was growing up and as he himself went through the film in, uh, industry as an actor, you know, and as a director, he was just really starting to get into directing at that time. Uh, he's seen that, you know, black people act a certain way. Like when he was a kid, who knows what kind of movies he saw when he was a kid. He probably saw thugs. He probably saw, you know, people that were subjugated to being less than the uh, the black or the white person. Um, and that was what was acceptable. That was the way that it is. And that fit, kind of fit into the idea of the story of how a black person fits in. So looking back at that, it's pretty easy to say, wow, that is some BS. But he was coming from where he grew up and how things were kind of like as a kid, what was, what was uh, presented as the way life is in the real world. And so here we are decades later, him as a director trying to make this great film and he's directing me to be black um, from his experience and how he envisioned the story to be. I think that we can make a difference in having more positive black people or positive non-white people shown in a positive way so that, you know, um, the future filmmakers, the future, you know, the, the future leaders of America or the world can look at a person and not have to think that they're a certain way by what color that they are based on what their experiences tell them. So um, I don't know if that kind of got off the, off the subject a little bit too much, but I, I kind of thought it was a little bit relevant to what we're trying to talk about today because race does matter. Representation really does matter um, to a whole generation of people. Uh, and it's even good to me, it goes beyond the people that are like overtly prejudiced. It's just like, you know, let's present people the way that they really are or the way that they could be. And that's starting to happen a lot more these days, well, which I'm very happy about. Yeah. Let, let me, yeah. What you're pointing to is all of the, all the stuff that we want to get to. I do want to hear from Keith though, before we, be, before we get too far down that road. Um, oh, Keith is on the show too. I thought this was yeah, just Keith about is, me today. Yeah. Keith is definitely on the show. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I got on a little roll and I just could not stop. No, that's all right. I mean, you're pointing to, I mean, listen, we're, we all are, we all are exposed to these false narratives and we buy in. And so that's a lot of what you're pointing to here. So thank you for that, sharing that antidote. That's interesting. Sure. Um, and so Keith, um, why did you choose the craft of acting? Um, as a man of, uh, you know, of color, um, what has been some of your experiences and what have been some of the perhaps cultural supports that have supported you along the way? Uh, I, yeah, thank you. Uh, nice to be here. Um, I, I don't believe I ultimately chose uh, to be an actor. Uh, I say this all the time, you know, uh, I don't, I don't, I, I, I generally don't think artists of any stripe choose to be artists. It's, it's just what they are. You know, it's just what they do. Uh, I can remember going to summer school and being a, a, a very little boy in a production of uh, Thornton Wilder's Our Town uh, and then never coming anywhere near it for the next, oh, I don't know. 15 years or whenever I got out of got out of high school and into college and I think that speaks to a, a bigger conversation about how we expose you know, our African-American youth to uh, choices that are not necessarily those that will are guaranteed to create a living you know but are nourishing to to spirit and if pursued and if there is success they contribute this great wealth to the uh, creative co economy. 
uh, um, nourished us as a people. Uh, so I don't, I don't, I, that, that is all to say, I don't think that I was ever um, encouraged uh, to pursue that or anything else uh, all through, all through high school. And I remember seeing a production of uh, Arthur Miller's uh, The Crucible uh, at a high, a high school production and being so struck by that even in high school that I thought, oh yeah, that's what I want to do. But, but, but recalling as well that I knew that I would never realistically play the role of John Proctor on any stage that the, you know, in my, in my simple perspective at the time, realizing that the Western canon was not built for me, was not, was not the work that I was going to be allowed generally to do. Um, you ask what, what were some of my experiences? Well, you know, we can that 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 can get very tangential too. I mean, very circuitous road to where I sit right now. We can touch on that as we go on. Um, certainly, too much too much on topic to discuss here for me to go in any particular direction. But as far as influences, you know, I, I, my influences have been the actors that I appreciate. You know, whose work I see and so I, you know, I think I think um, as, as young actors we grow up looking at TV and film, and saying I want to do that, I could do that. You know, like the way somebody portrays a role. You know, wanting to uh, explore those energies. Um, no real mentors, you know, uh, which is lamentable. No real support for me doing the things that I do in my life that I can identify clearly and say, oh yes, that was a big help in my career. It's been an uphill fight, you know, and continues to be. Uh, and that is what it is. You know, we can talk about why it is, but it is what it is. Um, does that kind of cover all the, all the, all the questions? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being authentic with your experience. Um, and you've experienced a lot because you've um, been in a lot of different areas um, of the acting arts and as a writer, a playwright, an actor on television and on stage. Um, and um, I'm sure for Terrence as well, you've experienced a lot of different aspects of this um, industry. Um, what you were speaking of reminds me, actually, it makes me think that, Tamara, it's a good time to ask your question um, about the dynamics between acceptance and rebellion. Okay, great. Um, I love hearing the personal stories of how you guys uh, are, how you got involved in your career um, and how you were motivated to be part of it. Um, like, uh, Keith, I agree that um, when you're a creative, it just kind of chooses you, not you know, you know, not you go out and seek it. And sometimes even when you're on that path, um, you know, looking for something, you may go elsewhere and find your purpose, right? So like Bernie, uh, Terrence, the way, you know, you talked about your, what happened to you, it kind of motivated you to move forward, make sure you did something, right? So um, thank you for sharing your stories. So um, as Lane shared, my question is actually, um, comparing the difference um, between, um, oh my goodness, what was it, Lane? Um, what did I write? Yeah, I'm well, sorry, okay. Guys. Yeah, well, that's okay, because if you don't have it in front no. of you, let me just know, it's a great yeah, question, I don't. right? Because yeah. you're, you know, you're talking about um, role choices, right? And oh, pushing yes. against false narratives, right? I mean, one of the questions that I <laughs> would like to ask each of you is, you know, number one, do black and brown actors and scriptwriters have an obligation to push against societal norms? Number one, um, and number two, uh, we've seen over over time how different actors of color um, uh, interact with the industry, right? And so, Tamara, you were talking about uh, examples of Sidney Poitier and Harry Belafonte. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. The, and the, how the yeah. comparison between rebellion and acceptance. So whereas Sidney Poitier was um, an actor that was generally accepted um, by white film um, as a leading role and a, a, you know, a leading actor in the movies that he was in, where um, Harry Belafonte um, 
I don't know, sometimes considered more of a sex symbol. Um, I don't know if it's because he was lighter in skin color or whatever, whatever the reason was, but he was more um, because of his role in um, civil rights and the things outside of the um, industry that he was kind of, um, you know, they kind of didn't give him the roles that Sidney Poitier had, or he didn't choose to accept those. And so I, I wonder, um, as actors yourselves, about the, you know, how do you feel about, um, do you want to be accepted where you get all these roles, or are you really motivated to seek out things that, you um, that are more connected to you and set more example um, to those that will be watching what you do, if that makes sense. Uh, okay, so I, I can answer that first. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that when I, when I first started, I, I felt, like I said, I, I had a lot to say as an artist. And so I was, I did not, I was not very discriminate in terms of, um, the types of roles that I would get, but um, <laughs> the on the opposite side, Hollywood was kind of discriminant on what kind of roles I would be offered. <laughs> you know, I, I am a nice guy, and so um, I was given a, a lot of the roles where you know I would play the nice guy or the quote unquote magical ne negro or the the one that is you know um, again acceptable uh, in the the community whether no matter what race you were and so you know because of who I am I didn't really have a problem with that and also the fact that I wanted to work um, I think that now I am a little bit more discriminant in terms of what I do um, because I know that see there, there's a thing here I think that if you if you want to say something on a large scale uh, there is a case to be made for uh, becoming famous uh, and having a little bit of power um, so that you can, then can say whatever it is you want to say as an artist or do the types of roles that you want to do as an artist because you're quote unquote bankable. Um, that's changing a bit now because, you know, there's so many people that can make films that are really good that, you know, we have a little bit more control over what gets put out for people to see. So, um, yeah, does that kind of answer I your think question? That does. Yeah, she, she's gone off camera. Manal, oh. I think that that answers the question. Keith, what do you think? Um, yeah, I, 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 I think in encompassing both those actors that uh, Tamara mentions, we, we, we have to get slightly abstract and, 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 and understand that there is an overarching element that encompasses all that, that that we do in this industry and in America and that is American capitalism and right? I'm reading I'm reading a, a, one of the, a, the MLK biographies right now and uh, his, his his early machinations around uh, 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 social justice was about the nature of capitalism and how if you are uh, beholden to this this structure of making money this hierarchical structure of of power built on the backs of people who have less of it you know, that you cannot uh embody the christian doctrines uh of uh, christianity has no has no social element in that way if, if if christianity is about taking care of one another Right and making sure everybody has their needs met. You can't. You cannot adhere to that, and you can, and, and 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 capitalist ideals at the same time. And when we look from that perspective, we have these actors who are inside of that, coming up early in the period where uh, actors of color were were given any entree whatsoever. And ultimately, at first, I think as as as, as if I understood Terrence correctly, he would agree. They're doing what they have to do to have the job. They they are they are they are chosen. They step into this. It's not necessarily because they're the best people for 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 the role or the best actors, but they're the ones that by 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 fate are they get the work so they adhere to the extent that they have to until there's a place. And both Sydney and uh, and, and 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 Belafonte push back at some point uh, and 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 and. 
and took on the role of activist to a certain extent. Uh, all that was going on for both of them was managed by a much larger moneyed white structure and, 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 and continues to be. So, you know, I, I, all, all, all of the work that's happening in the industry now, even though there are more black faces, more black uh, entree, uh, more black agency, I don't think we can lose sight of the fact that it is still being controlled by a structure that says yes or no and can say no at any time, right? Can turn it off at, 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 at any time. Yeah. So yeah. I, I heard I heard you, um, Terrence, when you answered, I was uh, trying to bring Michael uh, Boatman on at the same time, but I was listening um, and I appreciate both of you guys answering. So um, the fact that it can be changed at any time and, and there seems to be an over, overarching control over the roles and the money, um, how do you how do you propose we change that? And it's a very broad question, but how, how do you think that as a culture and as a group, we can change um, how that's happening? Well, my answers to that are rather pessimistic. I would, I would defer to Terrence because he seems like a more optimistic cat in general. So, <laughs> so. Uh, well, I do have an answer, <laughs> uh, Keith. And, and in fact, it, it kind of um, touches a little bit on what you kind of got into on your last response. Um, I think that I am a bit more optimistic because people have more power today. Uh, people, uh, it's it doesn't, you don't have to have a big blockbuster uh, budget to make a good movie today uh, like you may have in, in the past. You know, um, movies, rarely movies are being made on iPhones, but they are being made on iPhone. You know, like there was, um, a couple of uh, movies that actually got nominated for an Academy Award that were shot partially or fully on an iPhone. Um, they weren't big blockbuster hits, but they made an impact. Um, people do it every day. Some of them are going to be good. Some of them are going to be great. Some of them are not going to be so good. I think that, um, so from that point of view, um, that's taken a little bit of the power away from those people that, that tend to say no. Uh, and that applies not just to black people, it applies to all cultures and you know sexuality and genres, et cetera. Um, but in terms of the big picture, the big picture, you know, where they're putting a whole bunch of money in and they're saying this is what we want America and the world to see. Okay, that's that's a different story right there. And I think, and this has always been true, and it's especially true in the idea of capitalism, success. Success is, is, is the ruler. You know, when Black Panther came out, nobody on this world, except for maybe the people that were making it, expected it to be a, a big, big profitable picture that was, you know, going to make one and a half billion dollars. Who would have ever imagined that 20 years ago, that a mostly all Black movie made by a Black director, Black producers, would end up making $1.5 billion? So Hollywood. It got Hollywood's attention. It obviously got the, the world's attention because they were paying money to see it. Um, my point is, I think that, you know, part of this kind of goes back into a cultural thing, you know, where, you, where, you, where you're making movies, where you got, uh, you're giving young black kids the idea that they can do something, that they can achieve something, that they can potentially have an effect, a good effect on a large group of people. Maybe they'll grow up and they'll be, you know, the next big directors. And so it's like a cultural thing that can be continued, just like there's been a cultural thing of holding, you know, the certain ethnicities down in Hollywood. We could start making change by being more successful by, you know, Barry Jenkins, you know, Ryan Coogler, having people like that and, and people going to see those movies will always get people who want to make money in Hollywood to do more movies like that. It's going to be, I think, a slow process, but it's a beginning. And um, for, so from that point of view, yes, I, I'm not completely enthusiastic about the idea of it happening right now, but yeah, I'm positive. I think it can happen. As long as we keep seeing movies like that, they're going to have to just pony up that money and keep making it. Let me... Uh... Please. Let, let, let me interject just a little bit. Um, Marvel 
<laughs> is not is not black producers. Marvel is a huge white company traded publicly to other rich white people. Uh, there are no black people, uh, you know, very 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 few uh, in, in terms of the numbers, who 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 trade on Wall Street who have that money, right? Mm -hmm. So 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 there's the there's the white power again, and when when that product starts to become subversive in a way that is difficult for the structure that 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 threatens the narrative in a way that threatens actual change you will see that go away you will see it go away now meanwhile yes black bodies black expression black artistry all having its day there's no, there's no, there's nobody who can, who can, who can push back. I mean, that's 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 wonderful. I have no argument about that. I, I think we can we can open a discussion about what they are, are are expressing, what they are portraying, what what is being put out there, and why, you know. Um, but I, I I can't I can't argue that there's a value that it's that that that, that we are arrive or arriving in that way. All right. I, I to, just a moment, Terrence. But before oh. you before you come sure. back, let me please welcome to our forum um, actor Michael Boatman. Thank you so much, sir, for taking your time. We really appreciate you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to read your up. Oh, you're on mute. I am terrible with technology. Can can everybody hear me? Yes, we can yeah. hear you. Thank you. Sorry, everybody. For Please forgive my lateness. I wasn't able to find the link that needed. None of my kids are in my house now, so that's my. Uh, Everybody that's needs where I, am. I know it's you got to. <laughs> somebody has to start the, uh, a rent a kid business or something because. Right, I can't. I can't call anybody to say come and help help me do this, but that, uh, I made it. So thanks. I'm right. glad to be here. Hello to everyone. Welcome. We greatly Thank appreciate you. you. I, I want to go ahead and read your bio. I know everybody knows who you are, but I'm going to do that anyway because you went to the trouble of sending it to me um, <laughs> and for the purposes of the broadcast. And then um, you can either jump right into this conversation or uh, oh, yeah. we can we can backtrack a little bit so you can just talk about yourself for, for a moment. Um, okay. uh, Michael Patrick Boatman was born on October 25th, 1964 in Colorado Springs, Colorado. While growing up in the area of Chicago, Illinois, he developed an interest in acting that led him to enroll in Western Illinois University's theater program. After performing in a variety of plays that included A Midsummer Night's Dream, Pearly Victorious, and The Seagull, Boatman earned a Bachelor of Arts degree in 1986. Prior to graduation, Boatman showed great potential when he won the Best Supporting Actor Award for a performance in the Irene Ryan National Competition at the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C. He then started his professional career by working for a casting agent, which eventually led him to the role of Motown in Hamburger Hill. From there, he moved to New York City to perform in a series of off-Broadway productions. This in turn led to the role of Private Samuel Beckett in ABC's drama, China Beach. Boatman sent, spent the next several years in a variety of film and television projects prior to being cast alongside Michael J. Fox as Carter in ABC's Spin City. And I think that's where many, many people uh, really got their taste of you and, and fell in love with you. Uh, for his work on the show, he won a GLAAD Award for Best Supporting Actor in a Comedy Series and was also nominated for two NAACP Image Awards. For his work playing Stanley Babson on the long-running HBO seri series Arliss, he was nominated five times for the Image Award for Best Supporting Actor in a Comedy Series. He resides in New York with his wife Myrna and their four children, and you can look him up on IMDB backslash Michael Boatman. Again, thank you for letting me read that. Thank um, you for reading it. Wow. In, indeed. Um, and who, are they, who are they talking about? Yeah, who he? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's funny when, listening to somebody else read your bio, isn't it? It's interesting. Uh, it, it, it is a little awkward. That, anyway. But go ahead. I'm sorry. No, it's fine. All right. Go right ahead. If I may jump in to what um, Keith, I believe, was saying um, just a moment ago, um, I, I have the sort of peculiar perspective of being both cynical and optimistic about um, many things, but obviously, particularly um, Hollywood and Broadway. And um, 
so much of, of my perspective, I think, has been fueled by um, sort of perceiving myself as, and sometimes being perceived by other people in the industry. Maybe as something of an outsider, you know, I've, I've been uh, I've been told by um, people on some shows I've worked on, oh, you know, if I was a guest star on, uh, you know, a black a, a black show. You know, I've I've literally been told, oh, what are you doing here? You're a real actor, which you know, for me would would just sort of sort of blow my mind about what acting is supposed to be, aren't we? You know, but it also sort of goes back to my own sort of experience of growing up on the South Side, speaking a certain way, being teased, and, and that schism between sort of those of us who value education and those of us who who haven't quite been so fortunate as you know, and so. So I've always sort of hovered in between those ex so many extremes as a black man, as an artist, as a as a, a lover of, of of art of all kinds. And my my cynicism and my um, optimism comes out of certainly, obviously, uh, not only long experience, but also, for instance, with the with the Black Panther um, mention, I I was and remain, but I was a lifelong comic book collector. Um, and as a child in the 70s, late 60s, 70s, when I grew up, I, I imagined one day that I might see Thor and uh, the Hulk and all of these people on the big screen. Silver Surfer happened to be a particular favorite. Black Panther, the Falcon, a lot of the heroes that were Black, that looked like me, that, that I was familiar with as a kid. I, I, it, it was sort of fell into the same category as a Black president. I know it's gonna happen one day. I don't know if I'll ever live to see it. Well, here we are in whatever year that was when Black Panther premiered. And the miraculous thing for me and what makes me optimistic before I get into the cynical bit is the moment um, Chadwick appears as that character and starts doing what we all have associated with uh, sort of uh, white male hero stuff and that the movie is driven by his character and by his character's um, you know, inner conflicts and all that, there was a moment for me of holy smoke, this, oh my God, sort of speechlessness. The, that this was actually happening, I had in fact lived to see it, but there was another layer that was engendered by the fact that I was sitting next to my children. I have four kids, the oldest is 26, my daughter, and my son Jacob is 18. And for them, no big deal. Of course, there are black superheroes. Why? Why, why wouldn't there's, there was a black president? Why that generational <laughs> schism between what I believed was possible and probable, uh, which for me couldn't quite cover that gap into what is obvious and inevitable, was was an amazing experience for me. I mean, I paid three times for all of us to see that movie and and had something of almost a, a religious experience in the sense that yeah of course we are still in this place where we're where we're 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 you know beset by problems like uh, you know the death of George Floyd and Trayvon Martin and all these sorts of things but on another level and I often think I, I equate this to President Obama's um, presidency in this way. There are plenty of people who say, oh, you know, Brock didn't do anything for us. Oh, we're still, we're this, we're that, we're this. And while I may disagree with their estimation on some points, the one thing that is undeniable to me, and, and having seen it through my kids, is, is that there was a psychic or psychological or, um, I don't know, emotional content to his, to his presidency that may in fact be more valuable in the long term than any of us will ever live to see. Just that the difference between me saying, yeah, I knew there's gonna be a black, black president one day, but not really believing it, mostly in the, in the sense that people would say, come on kid, you can be anything you want. And in my mind, I'd go, yeah, but not the president. Two, my kids, you know, no big deal. And, and while some people, and my wife and I used to sort of argue because my wife would say, well, that's sad. They should know their history. They, they do know their history. 
but the, the time that they're living in now is their time and they're going to have children for whom it's going to be pushed a little, a little further. That envelope is going to be um, widened that much more. Now, I, I, the cynical part of me comes uh, in where when I think about all the times, particularly early in my career, when I heard jokes from teamsters, from uh, makeup department guys, from the guys who run the trucks and uh, in the, you know, on Broadway and in film and television, you know, harmless in their, as far as they were concerned, jokes, sort of side comments, uh, you know, that today would absolutely be um, forbidden and, uh, and, and would be punishable. And it was initially when all of this stuff started, the Me Too stuff and everything, I was sort of a, the mind like, really, do we really need this? But all it took was me seeing this gentleman that I worked with many years ago on the set of China Beach. And I'm assuming he may, he, I don't know if he's still around, but he just, it was like, he was going to tell me a black joke every single day and just, just to, and I'm young. I'm from the Midwest. I don't do conflict. I, I'm in Hollywood. I, I'm thinking you got to go along to get along. Uh, this guy is a teamster of, you know, legendary status at that time. So what did I do? What could I do? What could I say? As far as I was aware, nothing. So I, I, I grinned and bore it, as they said. When I think about that kid, because I was 22 years old when I was working on that show. Um, when I think about that kid going up against well, even my daughter, who is starting her career as an actress, that is, there's no way that she ever would have tolerated such a thing. I'm the one who was left with sort of 10 years of like, oh, and feeling and uh, being uh, uh, triggered because of these things that I heard for which I had no voice. And think about it, 20, oh, 20, 35 years ago, whenever that show, there was, there, you know, there was no representation, you know, in, in the ways that we have today. And so my cynicism, the mix of cynicism and uh, uh, optimism comes from seeing the possibilities of the future and also um, having to deal with uh, the legacies of the past that we still have yet to really acknowledge. Thank you. So, you know, while you were speaking, what, what, what are really thinking about um, is a lot. Um, so given that um, film portrayals, Hollywood portrayals are, are so influential um, mm. to people and that people really will swallow you know, a lot of what is up in front of them. So that, and, and in many ways, even though we are seeing, so I have a question here, so bear with me, that we are seeing more black film, more black writers, more black filmmakers, more black actors, right? And more black stories um, uh, portrayed. Um, my question is, um, is do you feel like, what is the impact of that on the actual industry? There's still colorism, right? There's the, uh, the, 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 the um, competition, right, for roles is still so, is very fierce, right? And, and it is about money. Um, and there are still some major gatekeepers in the industry, right? How many of those people are black? And yes, there are more of them because of the more money you have, the more you can make your own movies. But what is the difference being made? And is this going to, is this lasting? So Michael, you said, yeah, because my kids definitely are having a different experience than I had, right? So yes, mm -hmm. it's shifting, but are we really, are we moving forward? What do you think? Is the film industry, is, is the theater industry really changing as it, and is it changing for the better? And is it making a, as big an impact as we want it to make? for black people and for people in general in terms of bringing people into reality and affinity with each other. Does that I, make I'd sense, like my question? Yeah, I'd like to speak on that if I could. Um, just, just to finish off, um, Keith, when I mentioned producers on uh, Black Panthers, um, I was not referring to the, the production company and distribution company, I was actually referring to Forrest Whitaker and Ryan Coogler, who were the direct 
producers along with a few others on there, but I, I totally got your point. Um, in regard to what you, the question you were just asking, um, and, and also I appreciate the viewpoint and, and what you had to say, Keith, on this particular subject. And I love the fact that it was not exactly mine so we can have a discussion about this. I think that anytime something important needed to be done, whether it was you know in a local community or in an industry, uh, it wasn't easy. It's never going to be easy. Uh, I am sure, I, I'm not personally involved or have personal knowledge of what it took to get Black Panther made, for example, that particular movie or other movies like that. But I know that there was a struggle. It was not, somebody was not like saying, hey, listen, Black people, do a movie. Yeah, be a hero. We want to change something here. We want to get some different viewpoints out there. No, no, that was not said by anybody. I'm sure right. they fought to get that done. It's this is something that is a cultural shift that we're talking about here that I think needs to occur. Um, so that, you know, like for example, what Michael was just talking about, you know, his kids were like, okay, yeah, black president, yeah, okay, black superhero in Marvel, yeah, okay, what else? You know, they they kind of they didn't live to the point where that would never ever happen when we were all growing up. But now they're in a they're in a society where it's a little bit more acceptable, but they fought for that. I think that the reason why I am po leaning towards positive in terms of the question that you're asking is because, you know, people are fighting. People have always fought, but now they're starting to actually get little incremental gains, you know? And my thing is, if we can get more people that are interested in showing Black people in a, in a, in a way that would be hopeful that they can get stuff done, then we could potentially, like I was saying earlier, have more people in the industry that will show more of that to inspire other Black people and other cultures or ethnicities to, to get the idea that, yes, I can do this. And then they'll end up making movies that will not show people in a, in a lesser light or in a lesser role or whatever. Um, I love the fact that, that Michael was playing this, uh, <laughs> this Republican on the uh, you know, the good wife and the good fight. You know, here's this black guy who's the only, the main, one of the main lawyers in this firm, and he is a black Republican. <laughs> I just love that. It, it kind of showed the other light, and um, it also showed him in a leadership role. I think that if we fight, things can change. I think that it may not be today, it may not be tomorrow, but it's going to happen as long as we continue to fight and push for things going in that direction. And that's just, the way I feel. No, thank you. It ain't gonna be easy. I'm not saying that. It never has. It, it never has been. It never has been. It's just interesting watching what that uh, what is happening on, on Broadway as well um, with all the black theater that is being made. It's really exciting, and it's an exciting time. And my experience says there's a backlash to everything. So I'm, you know, Keith, what do you think? What's your opinion on that? On which part of that? Well, any part of it. I know I said a well, lot. I think, I, th I think, I think yes, success, you know, what, 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 what Terrence ended with, that you know, if we fight, it will change. And that's true as long as it feeds the bottom line. As long as this, the, the, you know, uh, at the end of the day, Hollywood is a community of business people uh they they are doing business and whatever the quote unquote art it can be good art it can be bad art but if it makes money you know, that's going to fly until it threatens uh uh, uh in, in, in an unimpeachable status quo the status quo may be shifting you know a little bit but this is this is still the 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 age and the and 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 the world of white money and power uh, and you see that in, on, on, on Broadway as well. And I say that because people want to look at all of this stuff that showed up in the, in the wake of George Floyd and COVID, you know, the new Broadway, Black Voices. And, you know, I've seen most of it, uh, uh, not all of it, and I find none of it threatening of whiteness. Uh, and there's a reason for that. There's a reason why these white people rallied these businessmen 
said, we have to get a hold of this and put this out there and say we're on board, but we don't want anything that's going to upset upset the apple cart. So there is there there is no threatening black theater. You know, it is it is looking at black people uh, be funny in their homosexuality, be funny in their domestic lives. You know, there was a show. One of the first ones to come was 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 called Chicken and Biscuits. You might as well have called your show Comfort Food, right? Which was was what did simple comedy reminiscent of the 1970s television, you know. Um, and of course the industry said, here, here, see, we, we, we love black people. We love black voices. There's something behind that. Right. And it's, and, 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 and I don't see it as us making progress. I see it as us being, uh, uh, you know, for the people who are in it, that's their shot. The people who are in it, this is their, this is their, their entree to, to the money, right? This is a place where they can come become part of this machine. They're not going to say no. Right. They're not going to say, hey, I, I got this I got this serious sociopolitical piece that's very indicting of, you know, American corporate structure. And they're not going to they're not going to lead with that. Uh, um, so I guess I'm 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 I'm, I'm, I'm the voice tonight of uh, yes, but, you know, uh, I, just, I just want people to stay aware. I, I see the changes, too. I see I see the growth. Things are evolving. Things have to evolve. You know the uh, the 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 what 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 is it the 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 arm of the moral universe bends towards justice is that it arc of the moral universe bends towards justice I suppose that's true, oh. but it's very slow, and uh, I think in any discussion like this that we engage we have to be uh, forthright. It's easy. Complacence is easy. It has been made easy by 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 capitalism and 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 and, and uh, the distractions of all the things that we have to look at while forging our lives you know um, it, 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 it it's easy not to see a controlling arm in all this but there is one there has always been and there continues to be and um, making work that matters is, uh, is 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 a is a struggle, you know. Is is uh, Curtis, what's his name? Uh, who 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 made who made, who made uh, power and all the power offshoots? Is he making work that matters? No, he's making money. Right. He's making money. That's <laughs> interesting. Uh, uh, and and and, and I, 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 I I think we have to talk about that. You know, is that a success? Well, it's a success for him. You know, and I guess on some level, success for a lot of actors who wouldn't have had a job unless they were black actors who could play gangsters. You know, um, is it success? That's a that's a relative question. Uh, I hope I, I hope I've been clear. It depends. It does depend on <laughs> depend on your perspective. I want to get Michael to weigh in on that, and then I want to come back, Keith, yeah. and have you talk a little bit about Untitled World at all because you're pu pushing a, a back against that a little bit, and then I'm going to have. Um, yeah, Michael, what do you think? Yeah, um, can everybody hear me? Did I do this yes. correctly? Yeah, yeah um, I think uh, where I think we fall um, short of sort of being, being efficient in regard to moving these issues forward is um, I think believing that there's only room for a few perspectives. We have to have forthright conversations. We have to have yes, but as Keith said, and we have to have, you know, um, the rosemary, the rose colored glasses um, because we are battling, encountering um, a, a panoply of perspectives on the other side. Our, I, I used to, I was just thinking today, strangely enough about, I heard something on the radio where they were talking about the black community. Now we've all grown up hearing that term. Um, my, my parentage is all from the South and, you know, and I'm sure there are people here who's folks are the West Indies or Africa or, and so as I think about it, I always think, well, what black community? Uh, my black community is the South side of Chicago of 1975 or so to 1982 when I left to go to college. And within that community, there were 
within my family, there were numerous perspectives. Um, uh, Terrence, thank you so much for mentioning the, the character I played on The Good Wife and The Good Fight, um, because that was, first of all, the, the, the difference, the difficulty in playing a character who um, diverged so, so completely from my own real life taught me lessons that I thought I had learned long ago as someone who at this point, you know, I've been, I've been an actor for 40 years. But what it taught me to do was to find, as I've always tried to do, the, the, the human being within the role, even if it may in fact be only a caricature. I say to my daughter who's starting her career, and to your point, Keith, um, I think those people on power have to do or should be doing, and I don't, I don't watch the show, so I don't know. But I feel like we make changes by subversion, by subverting narratives, because we're never going to be able to, you know, grab the main narrative and, you know, rip it apart and burn it and go, oh, it's all, it's done. And now our narrative, because our narrative is unfinished. It's, 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 Motile. It's it. You know, there's so many people who are contributing to our narrative. Um, but I do believe that the main narrative is coming to an end. I, I, I think many people sense a, there is a sense of something ending, something falling apart. I think to Terence's earlier point about capitalism. Yeah, capitalism is about making money, and uh, the money has figured out that oh, hey. Black or gay, I'm sorry, I keep doing that. I hate that um, dumb quotation thing. Black or gay or LGBTQ. You <laughs> okay. Or, or whatever the, 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 the cause du jour is, uh, is bringing them in at the box office. So, yeah, we're all for it. I, I think that's not where we're going to find um, a sort of relief uh, I, in, in the sense of, you know, the, the positivity of images that we're looking for. And Keith, you mentioned uh, sitcoms from the 70s. Uh, to, to this day, um, there are episodes of <laughs> um, Good Time, The Jeffersons, you know, um, of course, All in the Family, but I'm specifically citing Black shows now. John Amos and um, Sherman Helmsley are two of the greatest black father images ever in television history. Now, people have asked me about that opinion. They'll, meant, they'll say, but Sherman Helmsley, he was so, think about it. Think about what we saw with George Jefferson that we never see today in any character, any black male character, a man who was verbal, vocal about his dislike of white people, a man who challenged every man who had a different perspective, whoever came into his apartment to a physical fight. He, you know, in, in his comedic way, but you knew that that man, that character, loved his family, loved his wife, respected the, the, the world that he and, and Louise Jefferson had created. We don't see that character on TV today. So in the, the idea that there's something progressive about something that's so ancient now is kind of amazing, but I'd love to see more of it. And I think that and when you go and you, you read or interview, um, I've read interviews about Sherman Helmsley. I've read interviews from... John Amos as well. Neither one of them wanted to play those characters as written. Their particular force um, as men, as African Americans, uh, was enough to sort of steer the courses of those shows. Now, in the Jeffersons, obviously, it lasted multiple seasons, and you can say, you know, whether or not you think it was as great as it was when it started. But in the case of, of Good times, everyone has said, even Norman Lear has said it was a mistake to kill off the James Evans character, and that in some sense he might have felt like he did more harm than good for, uh, you know, I took it to mean for the black community. I remember the trauma of people going, they're killing James? They're killing James? Oh, what? What does that mean? Why would they do that? And then subsequently, the show becoming the JJ show, basically. So I, I, Again, for me, it's all got to be possible, but I think the, <clears throat> where it really finally lies is, and that's what I think uh, the greatest contribution 
that artists can make. It's art that will save us. Um, I don't know when, uh, but it's art that gives us subversive ideas and tells us, oh, you know, uh, you know, uh, 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 what do you, what do you think it means to be black? Well, I'll get that from a hundred or or a thousand different people. You know what I mean? It's so I, I I and I hate to sound sort of waffling, but I I think our our <laughs> diaspora requires um, airing all of our multiple perspectives honorably and um, and loudly at this point because I, where I see uh, a really big change, and it's only because of my limited perspective and my age and everything else, uh, my privilege, if you want to say that. I don't know what the younger, my, my daughter's generation say. They are incredibly politically astute. They, they've got all of this under, under their thumbs. I get yelled at when, when my kids were all home. I get yelled at every day about, I said the wrong thing. I called the wrong group the wrong name. I said the LGBT backward, whatever it was. And initially I'd go, well, you, you, know, you damn kids, what are you? And, it, and ultimately when I would calm down and sort of get out of my ego, I'd go, hmm, you know what? They're right. They're right. So I think the world that we may not be able to quite see yet because it's still maybe too far in the distance and we may not know what that world is going to is going to look like i don't think ever, any generation ever does um, know what the next has in store for it and with regard to the power people uh, again I, I i think about um our great our great heroes our uh you know our sojourner truth and our you know our the Underground Railroad. I mean, you got to sneak it in there somehow. And that's where I think the role for subversion. I, the reason I brought it up, um, Terrence, is because you had mentioned that character I played on The Good Fight. And what was so terrifying about it was I've always tried to make every character I play, whether I, I you know, I played, I played serial killers, you know, I played, you know, people that are different from me. Um, but my point, my, my role as an actor has always been to make that character a human being, make that character recognizable. Um, so that someone out there says, oh, I know that guy. Hmm, well, if that guy feels like that, well, maybe, okay, well, let me listen to him. I don't know, I'm presuming that that happens, but it's, you know, I've heard it enough, Keith, I'm sure you have too. I've heard it enough where someone has said, oh, that role you played, oh my God, I, you know, it definitely got me thinking. Now, as, you, as, as Keith said earlier, yeah, it, it, I, 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 we do this because it's work, because we love it, because we get a paycheck and all of that stuff. Uh, I just hope that as time goes on, we can find more moments um, as artists to subvert that narrative. Because that narrative is always going to be, even if it's only as a ghost sort of fluttering around all our ears, you know, well, in time to come. If some element of that nature is going to be here until it's gone. But we yeah. still got to keep moving forward. Well, that, that, and that's that, not to, and that's not to diminish that 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 um, that element at all. We still got to keep get up and keep it moving. Thank you, thank you, Michael. Well, that actually that's a good segue for me to, to ask Keith about the work that he's doing with Untitled Othello because you're you are. Um, what what you say is invites actors and producers to see plays through an anti-racist lens. So how do you look at a script or a role for an anti-racist lens? Um, and I've heard you talk about making that black characters more human to people. You know, tell, tell us a little bit about that work that you're doing. Well, I have to try real hard to encapsulate this because it needs some backstory. So let me see if I can be yeah. brief. Uh, if we start with American Moore, it harkens back to uh, Terrence's experience with uh, with Ben Stiller, uh, American Moore is basically a play about a man uh, auditioning for the role of Othello and being told by a much younger white director how to be the black hero. And uh, within the course of a, 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 a five minute audition, he has an hour and a half inner monologue. Uh, and, and, and that is the play. And, and the play was uh, ran off Broadway and they were post performance discussions. And uh, the, one of the questions I always got asked was, well, what about Othello? Let's talk about Othello. Are you going to direct Othello? Or are you going to act Othello? And I said, well, first of all, no, um, we don't have the tools to do that well 
here because we, we, we can't get past our privilege and we can't get past a three to five week rehearsal process. We cannot interrogate this play deeply enough to put it on stage in a way that's anything but a recycling of what's been done before. But the bigger issue is the only reason you wanna talk about my Othello right now is because this play is about you and you don't like the spotlight being on you. So you're trying to change the subject. That said, I knew the question would keep coming. So uh, over the first lockdown, I sat down and thought, let me go through, through Shakespeare's play and see if I can create a version of it that I think is nominally plausible. Because a big problem with Othello is that it is not plausible. What he has offered us is not truthful or honest. And the characters are shells. They're not really people. They're archetypes that might have been fine for his early modern audience. Uh, uh, they accepting uh, of, of, of the early modern theatrical conventions but it's not, it's, it, 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 it really won't work for us unless you just wanna buy that it's Shakespeare and that's how black people behave. Uh, so I did that through the summer of the first lockdown and looked at it and thought, okay, this, does, this, is, this is fine. This is something, this is, a, this is a shift, but I'm only gonna know if it has value when I put it on a group of an ensemble of actors and let them look at it for a long time and not only dimensionalize the Othello character, but all of the characters in his world that support and and uh, co collaborate in the tragedy because that's what we do. Uh, 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 Michael was was mentioning that we you know we 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 are trying to get audiences to recognize themselves in our work. So as actors, we have to deepen, like, especially with Shakespeare, who's giving us these archetypes. He's not giving us people, right? We have to for a contemporary audience. You have to dimensionalize those characters. That work takes time. It will not fit into the. American theatrical industrial complex capitalist model of you get three weeks and you put that shit on stage and we make money, you get your fee and everybody goes home, right? That's not gonna give us anything, anything new at least. So I was going to colleges saying, work with us, platform us for two weeks. I will bring, bring an ensemble of 13 actors. We will work with your students across disciplines. That's the, you know, theater, English, psychology, philosophy, Catholic studies, anybody who you want to bring to the table to interrogate this play with us and bring their contemporary perspective. Remember, we're actors. I'm, I'm a 60 year old actor. I'm going to do the thing that I was trained to do, which is three weeks put on a face and put it out there. I'm going to miss a lot. I need you to tell me what I'm missing. Right? I need you to tell me what's here in this 21st century that I'm not seeing. Right? Let's, let's, all, let's all talk. And through that process, we as a group can figure out who this, who this play is about. Now, this process for the actors requires that they get paid well, right? it requires they get housed, that they get fed, care and feeding of human beings. Right? Not, not, not what Hollywood will hand us or, or the theater industry will hand us, which is They'll make do with that. Equity allows us to pay you, you know, this much money. It's not much, but deal with it or some other actor will take this job. Hollywood does the same thing, right? Numbers are higher, but it does the same thing, right? We are about trying to create equity and human centricity in the work, um, bringing voices, uh, from across racial spectrums, sexual spectrums, gender spectrums, age spectrums, uh, uh, and, 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 and giving them the same platform to figure out what this play is about, right? And hopefully at the end of that process, as we go from university, right now we're in a, a residency which should last three years. So we're sort of set up, but the idea was to go from university to university, each giving us two weeks. And at the end of two years, looking at this thing that we made and said, okay, do we put this on stage? Or do we throw it away? Either way we got paid, the experiment was done. We've reached a lot of people. We've exploded a lot of minds, right? A lot of scholarship written on it. You know, we can be done. We can go do another play. If I may, I'm going to interrupt you just because we are very short on time. I'm sorry. I know we haven't had any audience uh, engagement, but we, our folks have had a lot to say. Well, you said you're blowing a lot of minds. How are you blowing minds like in two minutes? Like what's, what's the, what is the, what is the analysis revealing? A student in English class sat and watched us one day spend an hour around this table talking about um, uh, the term good wench, which Iago uses in the play and, and uh, to, 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 to his wife. We're doing this sort of cutting and editing of the play. And I say, I'm not sure this is relevant. And several people in the group push back, say, no, this, this needs to stay because it speaks to this aspect of misogyny in, in, in the world. 
And I said, well, it's elsewhere. We're trying to streamline this play. And we went on for about an hour and a half. And that, and that student whose work had been prescribed through high school, through college, about, about everything, right? And including Shakespeare, right? Was like, how do you get to do that? Is there a place where we get to talk for this amount of time about something like that, that one line, right? Which could change everything. And I said, yeah, it's a place like here. We can come together and we can talk until it's talked out. We can we don't have to put everything in this 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 soundbite frame, which 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 the industry is 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 pushing, right? We can talk, we can get together, we can support each other, we can hear, you know. I can, I can, I can do the introspection that will allow me an availability to see where my shortcomings are. What am I not hearing? You know, push harder. Um, uh, that's one example. And 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 there are any number because you can when you think about the 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 the, the, the toxic freight of this play um issues of intimate partner violence of uh, mental health class struggle on and on and on they're all in the play so they're all at the table when you really start to talk about the play not just do the thing that everybody else has done right i don't need to see another production of fucking hamlet sorry excuse my language i don't need to do i, I, I don't need to see another one i've seen it a million times there's nothing new that we're going to find in these plays until we do this work no okay thank you so i uh, yes a and you you didn't you said there's all those things and there's racism in that play and you didn't that that word never came out of your mouth and people don't recognize that until they actually have a conversation about that. So thank you. Terrence, I, I would really like you to talk just a little bit about your experience um, producing indie films and um, why you're choosing to do that work. Uh, you know, something that Keith said reminded me about, about that, about being able to maybe take more time or create something that's a little more artistic. Tell us what you what your experience is with doing indie films. Well, first of all, um, I think that this kind of ties into what I've been alluding to throughout this entire conversation. First of all, I want to thank you for having this this podcast because I, because I think that you know doing things like what you're doing um, is part of the way to fight back. You know, um, fighting doesn't necessarily mean using fists or or artillery or anything like that. Fighting means just being insistent of pushing forward an agenda. Uh, yes, it's okay to have an agenda. Uh, and I think part of what you're doing right now is pushing forward the agenda of, of having more of us represented um, in Hollywood, on Broadway, in film, et cetera. What I try to do, and, you know, just to give you an example, uh, my wife is a director, and she she was like, when she first started directing, she said, I want to make movies that, you know, kind of like um, show women in a good light. And I was like, okay, I get that. So you want to you want to empower women with your your art great go ahead and do that um you can't now that's almost people have said that in so many times it's almost becoming cliche i want to empower this or i want to empower that but i don't care i don't care people have been being empowered or disempowered ever since art has existed ever since film has existed so for somebody to say i want to show somebody in a certain light well good for you and as an independent producer that gives you a little bit more of a, of a chance to be able to to say what you want to say. You're not necessarily beholden to, you know, as they used to say a long time ago, and sometimes even today, the man. You know, you are the man. You're your own man or your own woman. Um, being an independent producer allows you to, if you can get the money together and you got your you got a script that can be pretty good, and you got a camera and you got a crew that you can get together, you can make that. That's what Spike Lee did. Spike Lee, Spike Lee, speaking of somebody that does not, you know, go along with what other people say, he decided to, to, he was one of the first black directors to put out a film, you know, that basically put racism front and center um, in New York. And oh, by the way, it did end up, it did end up having to make money. Um, that did wonders for the entire industry, in my opinion, pissed a lot of people off. But that's part of what, what, what it takes to make things happen. You go and piss somebody off when you get stuff done because people don't like change, especially in this industry. So being an independent producer, I, I decided to take it on as my responsibility to do the types of movies that come from 
my sensibility, you know, where we we do take a look at, like I I just finished this script that I wrote about growing up in Detroit and what it was like. And, you know, the, the stuff that I had to go through and, you know, it's it was real for me. And I said what I had to say. And I always knew that I was going to be talking about this when I was a kid. I even used to talk to my brother and say, I would have him tell me stories about because we were in that part of the town, you know, things that would happen, like, you know, people would get killed and, you know, there was a lot of drug deals going on and bad stuff would happen. And I thought that was just fascinating because that, I felt like I was in a whole nother world, but I wasn't, I was in Detroit. Um, so I knew that I could make a difference when I grew up by writing about that, you know, and people can take that as, as, as they would. I learned from him, believe it or not, because he was really into drugs. He got hooked on heroin when he was 15 years old. I had no clue. I just knew he was messed up as his younger brother. I took that as an idea. Okay, good. That's something that I don't want to do. And so I figured that he helped me out in a kind of a roundabout way just by, you know, falling prey to his environment. And um, he was a good guy. I mean, don't get me wrong. He's a great guy. Um, I, I, I love him. And, but I think that with my life, I can I can make a difference for others and for future others just by putting things out the way they are, the way I want to do it, because I'm an independent producer. And if it happens to make money, oh, that's even better. <laughs> yeah. That's just how I look at it. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I I watched Hiplet today. That was that was totally cool. Um, so oh. I want I want to invite uh, I'm going to invite you guys to put any links into the chat before we go. But Michael, I want to talk to you a little bit. People mostly know you from your acting, um, but uh, you're also a writer, a screenwriter, and you write horror. Is that right? What had you do that? That's got to be kind of cool. I can't hear you now. Can what what happened to your sound? And you're not muted. I hate when that happens. Check your, the computer sound and see if it's muted. Oh, shoot. Nope. All right. So work on that because we want to hear what you had to say. <laughs> no, I can't hear you. you might have to go out and come back in. I don't want you to do that, but you might have to. Sometimes your computer is actually on mute. Uh, try to mute it. Try to mute it and unmute it again, Michael. Yeah, he he did that once. No, still can't. No, we can't. We can't hear you. I'm gonna move on, but just keep working on it, okay? Go keep down talking, to Michael. The, go down to the left and see where it says mute, and hit one of those arrows, and then start hitting buttons and see which one of those works out. So I I am um, just curious, guys. I, I I we've got five minutes left, um, and we appreciate your time. Um, we we ask the same question uh, with each of these broadcasts. Um, race and ethnicity can be a burden, but and also an opportunity. Does that statement resonate with you? Why or why not? Real quick, what do you think? And Michael, you just keep trying to unmute, so just keep trying to talk. Terrence or Keith, what do you think? Race and ethnicity, a burden, or an opportunity, both? What do you think? It's definitely both. Um, it's definitely both. It, it always has been, and I think it always will be. I mean, depending, look, I don't, in case you guys haven't noticed by now, I am an optimist, <laughs> despite, everything that goes on, because I think that opportunities come um, all the time. Many people are not open to opportunities. Many people are too stuck in, um, you know, past failures or current failures to really believe that it's a real opportunity. Uh, many people, it's just like over their head. But I think if, if I try to be open uh, to possibilities, now, that being said, I'm also a realist, because, you know, I know about the BS that does happen, um, and especially in this industry. And I can recognize it when it does happen. I've experienced all kinds of stuff that I'm not even bothering to bring up because- um, Hello, hello. Just, Oh, hello. there you go. We got Speaking of opportunity, 
<laughs> okay. Sorry, Terrence. <laughs> go ahead, yeah, Terrence. Yeah. Finish, finish that thought. It's all good. We'll go back to Michael. I, just, I just think that, you know, like, for example, um, uh, the idea of being typecast, right? When I, when I was becoming an actor, it's like, oh, my God, you do not want to be typecast. That's one of the worst things in the world to be typecast as that Negro or that thug or that whatever. And it wasn't just for Black people. I mean, there's a typecast can be a thing for any ethnicity, any, you know, any gender, whatever. Um, I happened to do a class when I first got started getting into acting where I was taught, you know what? Being typecast is actually not necessarily a bad thing. You know, from the point of view of just working, you know, you want to be in that top five list of that casting director or that director where they know, you know, if they got a certain type of role and a certain type of character, let's call this guy mm -hmm. because we know he can do it. And that's for me, that was just like an opportunity to get working and get to the point where I can say and start saying no to certain roles so that I can say yes to the role that I do want. That was just for me an example. That's an example of a burden and, you know, an opportunity. They yeah. exist in life. So I think that's just the way it is. It depends on how you look at it and how you want to go about moving forward in your life and your career. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. And that's you that's good advice universally. So Michael, we got you back. Yay. All right. So, yes. so what's, up, what's up with the horror? What's up with the horror? Um, you know what, as a kid on the south side of Chicago, I think I was always fascinated by, now they call it dark fiction or speculative dark fiction. I was, I'm was i a voracious reader of all kinds of um, genres, but um, science fiction, horror, those sorts of things just always, you know, tickled some perverse element of me. Um, I, I've written tons of short stories and a couple of novels that have been uh, published in different places, but I never, I can encapsulate what, what galvanizes me to write by one meeting I had at a table, uh, at a book signing for uh, my first collection, which is called God Laughs When You Die. It was a collection of short stories that have been published in other places and other magazines. Um, a woman who was also a writer that was on this panel afterwards, after we'd spoken to everybody, said to me, I read one of your stories, the one about the mermaid. Now, um, in, at, to, to Terrence's earlier point, my mermaid was an African mermaid because that exists in our diaspora and our mythology as well. Well, what does that mean in the context of the American South of the 1960s? Where did this mermaid come from? What does she eat? How, all of that sort of thing. Now, that's what I thought this woman wanted to talk to me about. She was a writer of what at the time they were calling, uh, what is it, go, go on girl type, like street stuff, but the guy is always like out of, just out of jail, but he's also went, he's also gone to medical school and he's, you know, built and buffed. And I don't know what that genre is called, but it was really popular. So this woman says to me, um, oh, you write about, well, werewolves and aliens stuff and I said oh yeah sometimes and she said well I don't really get that and I said why she said aliens werewolves that stuff doesn't happen to black people and I, I remember just in that moment thinking but wait this stuff doesn't happen to anybody why are we excluded from our own imagination based on race and and it was always that. Yes, of course, the images we saw growing up, the Twilight Zones, the Star Trek, there were, you know, there were certainly characters of color, not a lot. But when you saw them, you identified with them. And so I never got over that identification that the miraculous, the, the you know, the ineffable can happen and does happen. I mean, I grew up in a tradition, half of my, my mother's family are all from New Orleans, so forget about it. And one of my aunts was supposedly, uh, you know, a, a, a person who practiced those arts. I don't want to. I don't want to say those things out loud. But um, so I grew up with a great deal of sort of um, superstition, both in terms of our family's sort of history of Christianity and Southern Baptist, but also knowing that there were darker forces and understanding that that some people are on the side of light versus the side of dark. You know. Some people say good and evil, however you want to say it. So 
So mm-hmm. I always was fascinated in 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 learning and writing about what that perspective is. You know, it doesn't take you. You know, you don't have to go very far into our into the diaspora's you know body of literature to find you know Brer rabbits and mythology, African gods and gods. You know, so it's a fertile place um, uh, to to write from. And um, and I think increasingly it's becoming uh, a fertile place that, that that people are wanting to read about. Yeah. How much, it, well, how, it, it how, is. You know. Yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt you because we are yeah, we yeah. are out of time. You know, one of the things though that you mentioned uh, that you continue to mention is that that we uh, that people of color have a, a very very diverse, rich rich background, and that we yeah. are continually pigeonholed. Um, and oh we don't gosh. really know what got us to where we are. And so really being able to explore uh, our history and open our hearts to our, our history is, is really so cathartic and does give rise to so much self-expression that will mm-hmm. help everyone, all of us to understand who we are, right? Not yes. just people of color, but everybody, right? Understand who right. we all are. Um, I'm going to ask, I did put some, um, some contact information or some um, Google information about you all into the chat. If you have um, projects or anything that you'd like people to um, follow you, please put that into the chat as well. Um, I want to thank um, our speakers, Michael Boatman, Terrence Bernie Hines, and Keith Hamilton Cobb um, for being with us today. Um, please check out these guys. Please also go to Untitled Othello because you can see some of the work that Keith has done on these college campuses. Um, it, it, it has been archived and it is fascinating uh, to see people picking through um, this information and the epiphanies that happen when you take the time to actually look at something in a way that you've not done that before. What does it mean to be a, a black person? What does it mean to be a woman? What does it mean to be? So all of, from, from, from every different perspective, this is very important work. I wish we had more time for this conversation. I, we really do appreciate you all lending your time and your talent. I want to give you all kind of a time to say maybe one sentence. What is the advice that you would give Someone who uh, uh, is is embarking on a on an acting career right now, a, a person of color. What would you say? One sentence. If you if you can't think of anything else that you just as soon do, then you must do this, and then there's nothing to do but do. <laughs> Thank you. Mm-hmm. Brilliant. And I I would dovetail and jump on Keith. Um, uh oh, hello. You still there? Yes. Yes. Yeah, I would jump. I would jump on Keith's um, 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 advice and say, and find a way to make yourself the best at it that you can. Educate yourself. If it's not in a college or a university, uh, private lessons or lessons that you know. If you, if you're in New York, Chicago, L.A., there's tons of acting school. But Thank you, Michael. Educate yourself. Yeah, Thank and you. I would I would jump on that and agree with what the other guys have just said. And also add to it that, you know, um, people do have success in this business. Obviously, success is something that can be defined differently by different people. But in terms of your success, people do have it. Uh, Look for it. Somebody's going to do it. Why not you? (laughs) Why not you? Brilliant. Thank you all for being here this evening. We greatly appreciate you. Um, uh, please join us on January 13th for our third panel discussion on race, ethnicity, and the arts. Our topic will be the human condition, appropriation of expression in art, music, and dance. Our panelists will be educator activist Rizwan Idara, educator Jillian McRae, and teaching artist activist Cornell Lord Judah Kerlar. We are grateful to the Rockefeller Brothers Foundation for their partnership in this effort. And if you're interested in learning more about Arts 10566, please visit their website at arts10566.org. And I'm going to invite last words from Tamara Bridgewater and Jermaine Smith. Go ahead, Jermaine. 
I just want to say thank you to everyone for joining us tonight. Um, amazing conversation, major dialogue, which is which was definitely needed. And as Lane mentioned, we were probably going on for hours in this conversation. So much more that we can talk about and, and dive into. I had a couple questions that I wanted to get in, but the conversations were so well done that I, I couldn't even sneak them in. But I appreciate all of the panelists for being here. Mm -hmm. um, such talents. I appreciate Lane for being here and our audience for being here to participate. Um, if you guys want any information from NU, you can send us an email at info at, at hello at nubuilds.com. That's enubuilds.com. And if, if you have any questions or any information needed from us, um, but definitely join the next podcast. And we look forward to seeing you all there. Have an amazing evening. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, guys. And thank you very sure. much. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Good night. Good night. God bless. Bye-bye.